Hi, everyone. We have folks still trickling in, but we are going to get started just being mindful of everybody's time. Uh, my name is Darla Bardine. I'm the Executive Director of the National Network for Youth. It's my honor to welcome you to our webinar today and to welcome our partners at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Today's webinar is going to cover online sexual exploitation. What is it and how NCMEC can help survivors? Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit about the National Network for Youth, if you're not familiar with us, is that we firmly believe that no young person in America should ever experience homelessness, yet research shows us that every year 4.2 million youth and young adults do experience homelessness in America, and the National Network for Youth is dedicated to preventing and eradicating youth homelessness in America. We are a membership network. We do partner with community-based organizations, school districts, state associations, and national organizations across the country. We do strive to provide excellent benefits to our members. So we advocate, we provide discounts, including a 25% discount on council and accreditation, as well as our annual conference in Washington, DC. And we also provide discounted uh, strategic consultation and technical assistance. Uh, next slide, please. And now it is my pleasure to introduce you our expert speaker today. Lauren Coffrin is the executive director of the Exploited Children Division at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in Alexandria, Virginia. And she's been with NCMEC since 2006. Um, she oversees the Exploited Children Division, which operates several programs, including the Cyber Tip Line, which you're going to be hearing about, and CVIP. In addition, she started the CSAM Survivor Services Program and works to improve the response to survivors of child sexual abuse material. So with that, I am going to hand it over to Lauren. Thank you so much for being with us today. If, if folks do have questions, please put them in chat throughout. We will get to them at the end. Also, this is being recorded and the slides will be available after the presentation. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thanks, Starla. I so appreciate the invitation and thanks to you all for attending and for coming, for wanting to be able to learn more. Um, I have the pleasure of um, being at the National Center for over 16 years now, working exclusively um, on child sexual exploitation, um, both internet facilitated and in the real world too. We've got a limited amount of time here today, so my goal is to give you all a kind of an overview. What's the landscape of um, online sexual exploitation happening in today's world? And more importantly, how can we as child serving professionals best help and facilitate um, you know, assistance to uh, children who may be in need, children we may be encountering. Um, now, please, as Darla was saying, I, I, I can talk, I can fill a time. But what's more important is that um, we're gonna leave some time for your questions. Um, I want you to be able to feel like you're leaving here today with really action-oriented uh, information, something you can do with. Um, so please feel free, add them all into the chat and we'll make sure um, even if we don't have the time to get to all of them, I'll make note and be, be following up with you all later. So as we kind of start and dive in a little bit, for those of you who may not be familiar with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, we are a nonprofit, non-government, uh, non-law enforcement organization started in 1984. Uh, our organization was kind of really bred out of heartache um, after the, um, the kidnappings of several high profile cases that really shined a light on the fact that while the laws across the United States um, were not necessarily established to be able to help facilitate a quick return home of children who may have gone missing. You know, we often talk about the fact that you could much more easily enter, uh, you know, a missing piece of property, like a stolen car into NCIC, but you couldn't enter a missing child. And across geographic, you know, barriers, there was a lot of lack of information sharing. So the National Center was kind of started as a clearinghouse, a way to be able to be an organization to assist for information collection and information sharing. Um, and we've really kind of taken that um, broad mission um, to kind of a robust place today. So um, our threefold um, mission is one, to find missing children. And in that way, we operate a hotline, 1-800-THE-LOST. Uh, we receive basically on average over 350 calls. That could be for both missing and uh, child exploitation as well. 
Um, we help produce um, photos, forensic um, uh, progression, age progression photos that oftentimes you may see when you walk into uh, your local Walmart stores or you see on Penny Saver magazines. Um, we're really trying to say that we're going to keep every missing child case um, alive and going. Uh, we will continue to age progress those photographs um, even well after um, that child reaches the age of adulthood. Um, we help rebroadcast Amber Alerts. Um, we're not the initial broadcaster, um, but we will help kind of put them through either to your cell phones or your Facebook. Um, more than 1,000 children have actually been recovered as a result of those Amber Alerts. So we do know that, yes, they may be uh, impactful on your cell phones when they buzz at random hours, um, but they're really the quickest and fastest way of getting information out there. In a lot of other ways too, we, re we support family reunification. Um, we try to make sure that when a missing child is recovered, we're, we're making sure that family is reunified in a safe and healthy way. Um, there may be a lot of uh, family systems at work and at play there. So we try to take all of those considerations in. And we also bring in a lot of volunteers, whether that be Team Hope, which is help offering parents empowerment. Um, we do peer support for parents who are in those cases of missing or exploited children who can connect with other parents going through that. Um, we also have volunteers for Team Adam, which are retired law enforcement who can be deployed out on missing or exploited children cases when there is um, you know, a, a large or an urgent need um, for additional resources in a local community. All that to say, the National Center has a really broad scope of the work that we do and the roles that we play in missing children cases. Another of our missions, reducing child sexual exploitation. I'm going to put a pin in that because we are going to get into that through the wealth of the today's uh, presentation and webinar. And then um, our final mission is to prevent future victimization. You know, what makes NICMIC so unique is our 30,000 foot view um, and the fact that we are an organization that has an awful lot of data that we can turn into um, information, prevention information. And with our more than 30 years of um, knowledge, um, that's kind of a responsibility that we have to be able to get that out into the community so we can all better protect our children. I encourage you, I'm not going to have a chance to cover it in today, but if you're interested or you want to learn more about the prevention side um, and aspect, we have wonderful resources, um, including our NetSmarts and our KidSmarts programs. We have um, you know, a new cartoon that's been issued into the cloud, which talks to children about keeping themselves safe online, um, as well as spotting um, individuals who are trying to um, in, you know, entice or ask, ask for sexually explicit um, imagery and pictures. We have stories from real teens um, to help kind of connect together um, what their experience has been um, in exploitation circumstances, um, talking kind of directly um, and in the hopes of being able to educate uh, through a little bit of uh, an appropriate storytelling. So, okay, all that said, we're going to dive in, get a little bit heavier now. Um, how do we know what we know? Right uh, At the National Center, um, our organization has reviewed over 650 million images or videos of child sexual exploitation. Uh, that has drastically risen over the course of the past several years. Some of that is the increase in accessibility of the internet. Some of that is due to the fact that companies are more proactively detecting um, and reporting instances of child sexual exploitation going on. All that to be said is that, unfortunately, it is far easier now um, for either bad actors to obtain access to child um, exploitation material or access to children, and far easier for children to be able to be found in that kind of a circumstance. Um, when we look at just the past year alone, um, kind of just giving you guys a, a, a closer scope in, um, reports to the cyber tip line last year included 85 million files and 44 million of those were video files. We're seeing this increase in, uh, in imagery, um, specifically videos being shared and distributed online that are starting to um, push kind of some of that need for more uh, sexually exploitative and sometimes egregious content. When we also look, um, we've seen increases over the years. So for videos alone, we're seeing videos itself uh, increase it. It's about 41% from the year prior. Storage capabilities are so much more significant. The ease of being able to create videos. How many of you are sitting at your desks right now with a 
with a video camera, a phone, right, easily at your disposal. Um, so things that were much more difficult to be able to produce were probably, um, you know, have access to webcams. Um, we're all Zooming. So the idea of being able to film and to create child exploitation material um, has just significantly increased in both ease and capacity over the past couple of years. You may also be wondering questions about when we talk about exploitation of children, what kinds of kids, what are we really talking about here? When we look at the imagery specifically of what is being traded online, what we see um, depicted, um, we see that in 64% of the cases we're talking about uh, female children and in 36% of the cases it's male children. When we look at age alone, uh, almost 60% is prepubescent. And the way that we determine that is looking at the sexual maturation of the images that we're viewing. We know these, um, these pieces of information because as uh, Darla mentioned, we also operate a child victim identification program where law enforcement from around the country, when they identify victims who have been photographed or videotaped, uh, they will send the identifying information into our organization to be enrolled um, in our clearinghouse um, as an active and excuse me, an identified victim of child sexual abuse material. We then are in a position where we can start tracking what is known to be identified versus what is still yet to be unidentified and then help to facilitate um, the proper research and hopefully the identification of those children who have not yet been taken out of harm's way. When we do know the identity of who uh, of these children, we would then also know who is the one that's filming them or exploiting them. Um, when we talk about imagery, and we're gonna spend some time talking about the sexual exploitative uh, imagery, but we look at that, and to many of you in this field, it may not be shocking, but um, that in a lot of these cases, it's someone with legitimate access to, the, to children. Uh, we're talking about parents, gar legal guardians, you know, another relative, um, a guardian's partner, perhaps, someone who has specifically sought out a relationship with an individual for access to their child. Um, we do see babysitters, mentors, coaches, uh, educators, but it's a sm far smaller portion of that kind of donut picture than what perhaps maybe in the media would make it out or to portray. Um, for us, well over 50% of that is someone who has that legitimate access to the child, and we need to basically make sure we're reframing that children who are seen in child sexual abuse material, children um, whose imagery is photographed, oftentimes, these are not missing children, these are not children um, who are, um, you know, runaways, these are children who may be hiding in plain sight children who are bearing a burden of a secret um, where exploitation is happening um, under the eyes of the community and no one quite knows that. Now, we are seeing increases where we see online enticement. We also see um, self-production or youth-generated content. There's a couple different names that we um, often refer to it as, um, where when we have to look at that kind of typology, we're really seeing that children may have uh, access to uh, phones, to cameras, to uh, gaming and streaming platforms and apps at a much younger age, yet they're sexually curious, as most normal children are. But that combination of access to technology and sexual curiosity can oftentimes um, create kind of like a firestorm of opportunity. And if there are bad actors who want to exploit that, um, there are, is much more opportunity these days for uh, a child to be enticed online, as well as children who may, because of their own natural curiosity or because what they're seeing in the community um, happening, may be creating a, se a sexual sexualized uh, or exploitative or even um, sexual acts um, and recording them on, online and then uh, posting and, and they may be sharing those. Now, we oftentimes, when we see the types of images that are trading from traditional collectors of child sexual abuse material, typically it is uh, the imagery that is produced by someone who has the um, access to that child and would be engaging in typically sexual acts. What we do, what we don't see as frequently in collectors or collections are the images of online enticement um, or you know, youth produced content. However, those images do tend to go viral much more often, um, popping up in local communities and schools and um, you know, church organizations, um, oftentimes at the hands of an offender who is intentionally trying to be able to exploit this child. We do see cases 
of um, imagery related to child sex trafficking, uh, though typically not traded in the traditional sense um, for child sexual abuse material, but oftentimes posted online um, in ads. And then we have a smaller component where there is truly um, someone who is completely unknown to that child um, or without you know, a very substantive relationship um, that has then engaged um, in child sexual abuse material. Now, I, re I realize and I appreciate that this is all pretty heavy topics uh, that we're talking about. Um, one thing that we wanna be able to make sure we're putting this in context too is to some of the recent changes that have happened. Um, we're all familiar with the fact that when the pandemic started and there was a massive switch and change over to uh, remote learning, remote uh, education, to Zoom meetings, to much more webinars like we have today, um, with that came um, some extra considerations. And at the National Center, we started kind of monitoring a couple of different things. One, the increase um, that children who previously did not have access um, to the internet or for technology or who may have not um, had you know, education and digital citizenships or some of their, you know, we call them their net smart skills, may have been able to have a little bit more access to the internet as well as unfettered access. Oftentimes, for those of you who are on this call and maybe our parents, you probably remember what that was like in the very beginning, trying to be able to balance both work as well as child care. Um, and so there were at times where we understood that parents may not have been able to monitor as much as they have would have traditionally, you know, prior to the pandemic, their children's online use. Um, the third component that we did see was we saw an offender switch and a switch to saying, well, if I can't get access to children in the real world, I will move into more of an online space. Specifically, we saw child sex traffickers saying, so trafficking in persons, I'll start trafficking in child sexual abuse material and imagery. Uh, we saw bad actors and offenders online talking about um, how they were going to use the pandemic to be able to entice more children. So while we monitored some of this dark web traffic and chat um, at the beginning, we really also started looking to see where these trends going to be kind of um, coming to fruition. And unfortunately, as you can see um, in the, the charts there on that right hand side uh, of the screen that between 2019 to 2020, um, 2021, we saw you know, at least a doubling of the increase of the online enticement reports for children. Um, a little bit larger in pace than what we saw of just traditional reports to the cyber tip line. Now I'll get into some of the subsections of some of the exploitation that we're seeing online and facilitated. But before we do that, I wanna give a little bit of context as to what I'm talking about when I'm referencing the cyber tip line. Um, the cyber tip line is a reporting mechanism that the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children operates. It is um, congressionally authorized to receive reports um, in about eight different categories. We'll get into that in a second. Um, but the general overall uh, view and workflow of how this goes is that an incident occurs, whether that be uh, a child is enticed online, whether that be um, a parent notices of uh, sexually explicit material on you know, a gaming platform or a system, um, or perhaps someone themselves accidentally stumbles upon or accidentally stumbles upon child sexual abuse material online. They'd be able to make a report uh, via our cyber tip line, which is an online form or also available through our call center at 24 hours a day. They would enter information about that incident. Um, and then our analysts um, at the organization would then prioritize that into four categories. One being an, an, an an egregious case where the child is in imminent harm and we have to handle that immediately. Uh, priority two, the child is likely to be victimized soon. Uh, the biggest example of this is perhaps um, a caregiver finds uh, you know, emails or course texts, correspondence that a child may be meeting up or making plans to meet up with someone to engage in sexually um, explicit activity. Priority three would unfortunately be that that child has already been victimized and perhaps maybe the information is now posted online but the act has already occurred. And then priority E or uh, electronic service provider report is any information that comes in not from a member of the public, but from a company. Think about your big names, your, you know, your Googles, your Metas, your Instagrams, um, WhatsApps, your companies who um, are operating with users all around the world and may be aware of child sexual exploitation happening on their platforms. US-based companies are required by US law to make reports to the cyber tip line. And so those reports come in 
And then our organization is tasked with being able to determine where in planet Earth does this report go to. So while we are the national center, we also deal um, about 92% of the reports resolve to foreign locations. So we're very global in nature and we have uh, law enforcement relationships um, all across the world. So we're looking to see who's the bad actor and also where's the child victim. Um, once we can determine locations for both, um, we'll generate reports where we add value. We look for breadcrumbs online. We try to be able to add as much information as we can to make this case hopefully viable, workable, and solvable for law enforcement. And then we make that report available to the law enforcement um, entities, whether that be a state or a local, an Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, uh, a federal agency. We have federal partners who actually sit in our building. Um, and so we're able to walk right down and talk to them about certain cases or, as I mentioned, or global uh, partners as well. When we look to it, the scope and the size of reports, the majority of reports that we're getting in, and I, I know I'm talking a little bit about child sexual abuse material, but that's the majority of reports that we're seeing is about the distribution, the manufacture, and the possession even of this CSAM material. Now, by US law, it's still called child pornography, but we at the National Center refer to it as child sexual abuse material or sometimes CSAM. Uh, we feel that this word and survivors have told us honors the experience of a child victim and a survivor of this exploitation um, much better than the term pornography does, which at times almost infers um, you know, a sense of consent or is too closely attributed to adult pornography and really doesn't acknowledge the sexual abuse that is experienced in order to be able to create this kind of material. Um, you can see here uh, that even when we're talking about child sexual molestation reports, those are reports that don't have to have any internet component as well. We will take instances both of historical um, as well as current child sexual molestations happening in the real world. And those cases themselves went up 150% between 2019 and 2020. Child exploitation just in general has just gotten a lot more complex. So whether it be children's interactions with social networking sites and the online payment services and video sharing and, you know, real world and criminal offenses, you know, children are rarely experiencing just one type of exploitation. So really there's a fallacy when we look at these numbers because a user typically has to select one case type. And as we all understand, um, individuals should not be forced to be able to choose their own labeling of victimization. Uh, many of these exploitations would fall under multiple offenses, whether that be um, an online enticement case that also created was the creation of child sexual abuse material um, that was started out perhaps with sextortion, but then led to um, child sexual molestation in person or child sex trafficking and the posting of CSAM material. These are complex interwoven uh, crimes that uh, we need to kind of take a different lens to as we start looking at what are these trends that are happening um, in the real world. We look at most specifically, well, how do I identify what, what child could be potentially being victimized? And unfortunately, you know, research really shows that this happens across broad socioeconomic, race, religion, any, any kind of stereotypes that we may have for child sexual exploitation is kind of being blown out the door these days. A child can come from a completely stable or a completely unstable home. You can see massive behavior changes or no behavior changes at all. They may appear distracted, or focused, you know, very introverted or very aggressive and defiant. Um, Sometimes you might be seeing the displaying of inappropriate sexual behavior, but sometimes not. Sometimes there's a closed offness and a reservedness about sexuality um, that makes it much more complex. And I think for us, what that helps for us to understand is that we have to make sure that we are not putting too much of a burden on disclosure. If we, we think about this, we know that disclosures of sexual abuse in general are low. For a child to come forward and to tell about what has happened is incredibly rare. And then in cases where images are found of abuse, a disclosure is often maybe forced due to evidence being found or being traded or distributed online. Um, we have talked to so many survivors who have explained that there is an intricate and really complicated phenomenon that when you are confronted with evidence, with imagery, 
of any kind of exploitation, whether it was discovered by law enforcement, found about by a parent, or by peers being traded online and being brought to your attention, there is an added shame and that it creates this un unintended just barrier to any kind of healing process that survivors would go through. They feel very exposed to the world. And while sometimes relieved that the, um, the exploitation may have stopped or maybe a secret is now out, there's kind of, kind of that complication now that maybe the offender was a person in a position of trust, or maybe um, the imagery was shared by those that were closest to them. Um, so really it kind of fractures this, these, um, these strong ties that they might have um, with just general positions of authority. Um, and so it makes the it makes the disclosure process incredibly difficult, even when going through um, trying to be able to obtain resources, trying to be able to, if it's a law enforcement investigation or a case, we have to understand that sometimes we as professionals in positions to help may inadvertently cause more harm by assuming that we might know how survivors feel about this kind of exploitation. Um, when we look at some of these kinds of reasons, information that we've heard that comes from a lot that it's important to just kind of consider as we talk about sexual exploitation is that oftentimes children don't know that they're being, um, that this is something that an adult would label as abuse. Um, too often I, we hear from children and from youth, as well as from former survivors, excuse me, from, from former uh, victims who have transitioned into survivorhood, who will indicate that, you know, I had been told and I had been explained about exploitation, but it was always from a perspective of, you know, a bad actor. Someone is trying, is going to try to trick you, but this person was my friend. This person was someone um, who took the time to get to know me. This person is someone who I considered was very close, or I have multiple other individuals who I've met in a similar way, especially when we're talking about online relationships that form. Some of the largest harm that we ever see happening is when we as a gener, I'm gonna say we, even though I can't see <laughs> you all here today, but that we that come from a generation that did not grow up with constant access to the internet via a phone, we presuppose that the only meaningful relationships that exist out there in the world are the ones that are met face to face. And especially the past couple of years have told us anything. Online connections are incredibly important to being able to um, manage and get through sometimes some stressful situations. Children oftentimes find um, unwavering support in forums um, and in social media aspects of acceptance um, when they're searching for that. And so therefore, uh, one out of three children, this is some research that's been done by Thorne, have indicated that their closest relationship is someone that they met first online. One out of three. It's important for us to know that and to think about that because when we talk about the dangers of online harm, we're looking at it exclusively from one perspective and oftentimes not counting or considering that the weight and the heavy enough about what all the benefits are from some of the relationships that are engendered online. So again, a child may not see any of this exploitation as part of an abusive structure and may not even identify themselves as a victim, um, even as they're going through some of the most challenging aspects of this. Um, for those children who may be um, in, in, a, in a home, in a stable home or even an unstable home, there may be a fear that if something happens, um, that they'll be taken out, that their, um, their guardians will be found to be maybe culpable, whether this is um, through a traditional um, contact offense of molestation or as well as something that's online. Um, we have to understand that whether in person or um, you know, in the real world or, or online, bad actors are complete and fantastic manipulators who are preying upon the fears of these children. We have seen um, online offenders talking about the fact that the child themselves, should they disclose anything, will be the one that will be going to jail that the child will be rocking um, you know, the home or the family structure that they may have and, and that they may care desperately about, um, that, that no one will trust them, that no one will believe them is common, uh, common terminology that we hear coming from offenders. Um, or they may, uh, children may have been groomed over a period of time. And, um, and that grooming may 
be in helping to instruct that child and to understand that this type of behavior is normal. We also have to be frank and look at cultural standards these days where we can't look at children and ask them not to be able to talk to strangers online, not to be um, exploring a sexuality online, when what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And we have the people in political um, power, we have individuals, you know, celebrities who have engaged in this kind of stuff and their, uh, their reputations are not harmed from this. So again, some of our traditional talking points just aren't fitting and aren't driving with the way children are understanding exploitation or not understanding exploitation online. What we're really seeing most frequently if we're talking about recent trends is an online enticement of teen males and um, one, something that concerns us the most is how swift and quick and egregious some of the exploitation that is happening with severe threats. And so currently going on around the country, um, uh, a, young, a young appearing female will target a teen male, typically between the ages of 14 to 17, um, reaching out to them through common platforms like Instagram or Snap, um, and just engaging with them, complimenting them, asking them um, if they're open to the idea of, um, you know, receiving an image from them from the female and, and possibly trading with um, an image of themselves in return. As soon as that young uh, man would end up trading an image, then immediately it would switch over into extortion. And what is most concerning for us is that it has very financial in nature. If we looked back at the statistics, maybe um, even four, maybe five years ago, I would be doing this presentation and saying that online enticement was happening to young teen girls. And those teen girls were being enticed online to create more and more egregious imagery um, for the sexual gratification of the offenders that were online. However, the recent trends that we've been seeing is that now, unfortunately, these are financially lucrative um, schemes to be able to trick small children, young children, youth, and, and even young adults um, into being able to create imagery and then leveraging their worst fears um, to be able to uh, facilitate payment. We're seeing payments happening through mobile, mobile to mobile payment devices. Um, we're seeing things like, you know, Cash App, Zelle, Venmo. Um, we're also seeing traditional gift cards. Um, some of you on this call may even have heard about some of these happening in your local community and local areas. Um, and so really what we, we try to bring this to attention is because the biggest piece of trying to be able to combat this, and we get questions a lot about what about monitoring software and how do we address this? How do we bring this to people's attention? What can we do to help prevent this? It's both the easiest and the toughest thing to do. It's communication. It's having open and honest conversations with children who are in our lives, the children that we are working with, to be able to acknowledge, not to be able to say we can completely prevent this, but what do you do if it happens? And some of that, we'll talk a little bit in a second, is about to not necessarily reduce, not, not to normalize, but to help reduce stigma and shame and give them hope of a way out of that circumstance. Unfortunately, these threats that we are seeing specifically talking about to these teen boys saying, I'm going to ruin your life. I'm going to um, tell, I'm going to uh, ruin your chances at college. I'm going to ruin your chances at a, um, having a job. I'm going to destroy any, any relationships that you may have. Um, I am going to post these all over online are really leading children to a sense of uh, hopelessness. And unfortunately, around the country, we have seen teen suicides uh, related to the sextortion um, and the online enticement of children. Now, these are all things that we have to be able to kind of consider because there is a weight to this, oftentimes a weight that many of you may understand that youth and children, you know, that prefrontal cortex not fully formed. So their judgment, their decision-making, may not be right there. Too often we talk with parents who say, I've, I've told my child, uh, school, you know, school counselors, like we, I've had conversations, we held assemblies, we talked about this. How could they have done this? And it's kind of trying to remove that burden to say, they're, they're minors. They're minors and they may not understand those consequences of those actions. What we have to be able to do is take a little bit of that shame and that guilt off and know that if a photo was taken, it doesn't have to be what they sometimes feel is the end of their world. So the goal for us, especially at the National Center, when we're talking about online enticement, when we're talking about online trends, when we're talking about this internet 
facilitation, which breeds this level of permanency, breeds this level of this is going to follow me around for my entire life, breeds this, this person can find me on social media. I don't want to give up my phone. I don't want to give up my social media connections to my friends, but this person is still, you know, this online enticer or this bad actor is still um, kind of after me. We have to be able to help provide children and victims and survivors with hope that your life doesn't have to be bound by the sexual exploitation that may have occurred to you. So specifically when we're talking, and I'm spending, I know an awful lot of time here talking about in the online enticement of minors, because it's what we're just seeing explode and happen so frequently is really empowerment, empowerment and education. And it starts for us pretty, um, pretty overtly by saying there are times that children are not going to come to adults. They're not going to feel comfortable. They're not going to want to, and we have to acknowledge that. So what we have to do is allow them to be able to take steps on their own. We created a website. You see it right there, missingkids.org backslash take it down. It's back. Let's take it down. And we're going to help walk children walk youth, and we know some adults too, um, how to be able to remove any type of exploitative content from the platforms that we see most frequently. So as a user to our website would be able to, um, to access, they would see that step-by-step um, -step guides, whether you're on your mobile device, whether you're on a tablet, whether you're on a desktop computer, this is also great for parents to be able to feel like, what are these next steps? And, you know, uh, educators, caregivers to be able to help with this process as well to to if they suspect or if there are things that they feel may be happening in their children's lives of how to be able to take back control because online exploitation of uh, minors really leaves victims and survivors feeling completely out of control. Um, so we want to be able to make sure that we're always giving them the opportunity to start by taking that back themselves as well as saying we are a resource and we are here. So we can assist you, we can help you, we can do all this, but if you never wanna interact with us at all outside of just seeing our resources and seeing the information, that's okay too. Now, we also have a survey that has been on our website um, and it's been there and we've received over 3000 respondents. And when we ask people about what is the most important aspect of why you visited the National Center's website? Uh, were you looking for you know, emotional or legal support? Were you looking uh, to start a law enforcement investigation through our cyber tip line? Without a doubt, all of those um, reasons fall aside and people say, I, I just need the imagery, the threats that are out there of my imagery being exposed to go away and I wanna get that content taken down. They tell us all of the obstacles that they would put in place of being able to go to a, um, you know, we often talk about, you know, a, a person of trust um, or a trusted adult. Um, and so they say, well, thanks, but no thanks. I'm too afraid that someone is going to, you know, if they have a good, uh, guardians or caregivers are going to threaten me and take away my phone. Um, I'm too afraid of law enforcement being involved. I'm too afraid of having to connect my imagery with my identity, um, with someone being able to actually having to um, visually confirm um, that those images depict myself. I, I don't want to talk to an adult. I don't want to talk to an analyst. And so this has kind of really helped us shape why the resources that we have in place are the way that they are. And about um, 35% of the cases, the children are saying, I actually have access to the images myself because someone sent them to me because they're still on my phone. So one thing we're actually working towards in the future is creating a way for the um, children to be able to hash. Hash means create a mathematical, a mathematical representation of that image or of that video um, and to be able to add that hash value to a list. And that list can be, not the image itself, just the mathematical um, uh, hash value. That hash value can then be shared with companies to be able to prevent any future type of spread. So what we're really trying to do is bust down this kind of old myth about once an image is out there, it's always out there. Unfortunately, if imagery is created or online exploitation happens, too often children say, well, what I've heard is that all of these prevention style messaging that's kind of come in, in my face before about your life will be over because this thing can follow you in perpetuity. 
And now that gets leveled on top of the extra shame and that extra guilt. So we're etching away and trying to kind of undo some of what this previous kind of messaging in the hopes of prevention has been trying to do and realizing that it's actually become a barrier. It's become a barrier to reporting and to disclosure and, and unfortunately some of that hopelessness feeling too as well. Now, I mentioned that we have resource, when we're talking about resources for survivors and resources um, for exploitation, what we wanna be able to make sure people know is that we at the National Center can work with companies, whether that be that imagery is created, whether that be that there are profiles um, that are um, you know, posting PII or information about survivors, whether there are predatory comments um, that are still kind of coming from the results of that exploitation. And the National Center has a notice tracking team where we will send notices to the company on behalf of survivors. And uh, in just 2021 alone, we sent out 75,000 notifications to companies, to registrars, to websites. And um, we had a 99% removal rate within two days, 99% within two days of time. We've had, you know, children calling us saying they've been trying for over two years to get some of the imagery that's been circulating them online down and that we were able to do it within a day. And while that is both um, wonderful news for them. That's incredibly frustrating as well, that the resources that exist currently at tech companies oftentimes aren't created with children in mind. So we can be that navigation. We can be that advocate between the child and the company to be able to kind of smooth out some of that process and make sure that we will never give up. We joke that the team's motto is annoying into compliance. There's no law saying they have to take it down. But we will basically just continue to annoy until that company realizes we're not going away. And so it probably just behooves of them to help get that content taken down. You know, at this higher level of things that we're thinking about trying to do, we really want to create an ecosystem. So, you know, if any of uh, the children that you work with or have concerns about this, we want to educate and make sure you all are aware that what we're trying to do and trying to build is help to disrupt, disrupt this kind of ecosystem. So, the vision for the work is, as well as this goes is that a child is able to report an image or a video. Now, it can fall into two categories. Either we can verify that the age of that child and it goes on one list, or we say this is an unverified minor. And then we actually just add those children's images to another list. And the we would then make a report to the company if that image reaches the threshold of child sexual abuse material, then the U.S. law is triggered that, the that they have to make a report to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. That report would then come back in around with information on who uploaded that, uh, who the bad actor was, and then we'd be able to get that report out to law enforcement to investigate that aspect. We at the National Center would tag that file. We would tag that as an identified victim. We would tag that as a certain egregious level. We would add that information to the lists and then we would share that information with the companies who then would block that, um, that from further distribution. But when we think about the resources that we have for survivors, the technical aspect, which to be frank, just does not get talked about that often, is only one tiny aspect and tiny part of this. We also have an entire um, different department called our Family Advocacy Division. And that division is really established specifically to be able to provide for the emotional needs of both children and families who are experiencing, whether missing or exploitation um, within their uh, family structure. So when we think about looking at kind of numbers, um, we take a look at that middle number there, have done uh, over 500 different clinical mental health referrals. Um, and a lot of those are to our mental health practitioners around the country who receive specialized training by the National Center and are part of our Family Advocacy Outreach Network. So if you know out there that there is a fantastic mental health provider, perhaps you yourself are even one and would like to be able to receive some training from the National Center, we would be happy we do that free of charge. Actually, everything that I'm talking about, everything I'm, that I'm talking about right now is free of charge. Um, and so this information is then able to be shared out as referral structures and we would then help do kind of some of those transitions um, to a client in need and would match them up with a counselor um, who we know has had specialized training in this issue type. We also have that Team Hope um, that I talked about, the help, help offering parents empowerment. 
That is both a structure of adults with lived experience that can connect with other adults with lived experience from a survivor perspective, as well as parents of survivors connecting with other parents of survivors. Um, and so they also help facilitate peer support calls. Um, we work with survivors and with parents about reminders of self-care. We do crisis intervention. And in just general, our team also, um, our team is established of um, mental health professionals, uh, uh, social workers um, who can provide instances of mental health support to anyone who calls into the National Center and, um, and maybe have a, in a need. When we look at this, the National Center offices kind of like a, a robust amount of services, which unfortunately, we're just not going to be able to get into all of them today. Um, but when we think about it, our organization helps in a lot, a variety of different ways. You see at the top of that, um, the yellow, you know, our organization helps to identify uh, children who have been seen um, in imagery or uh, sending out referrals on cases where the child is being enticed online. Um, we may be able to provide peer support, um, counseling referrals we talked about, as well as attorney and legal referrals. So if there's individuals who are experiencing a high volume um, of distribution of their imagery online, they may be, um, they may qualify for restitution. And that can be a very complex process to be able to navigate. Um, so you may need assistance from a private attorney who can assist in that process. You may need help with uh, terminating parental rights or legal name changes for survivors who are being stalked online still. So there's a lot of complexities that, um, you know, your average attorney on the street may not be aware of, but again, the National Center can help to make referrals to um, a, a, a wide swath of uh, attorneys who have an, a specific understanding about this issue type. We at the National Center can actually track um, the distribution of uh, child sexual abuse material and provide um, that information back to attorneys to help facilitate that restitution process. Uh, we talked a little about the notices and sending online takedowns. We also offer um, support for safety audits for survivors. We help them assess what their online presence is um, and based on what information is known about them publicly, whether it be through court cases or you know, viral information that's been shared, what are ways that they can help protect themselves? Um, and still being able to have access and still being able to be a youth and be a teen and be able to grow up using the internet, but also doing it in a safe um, and appropriate way. We've had some survivors who end up saying, I wanna help out and kind of come back around and become a Team Hope volunteer. Um, and most importantly too, as well, we also know that so much of our work and our programs are built on the fact that there's input from survivors with lived experience. Um, and so NICMEC does uh, consultancies um, with both parents, caregivers of, as well as um, survivors who have had a, a, a multitude of experiences, whether that be through child sex trafficking, whether that be through um, online enticements, extortion, traditional child sexual abuse um, or molestation cases, um, always kind of looking at what the core services that we offer are, what are the frameworks, where are there gaps in the systems, and what can we be able to do to expand on. Sometimes NICMEC isn't the place to be able to fix a thing, but we may be able to just shine a light on where some of that need is. So if I say that's a lot but also kind of just a, a nice sprinkling of what it is that the National Center can do in some of the most prolific cases of child sexual exploitation that we're seeing kind of coming through these days. For you and for what that means kind of as we wrap up is, well, well what can you do to be able to assist her in your roles? And with some of this is to be able, I'm going to share my contact information here at the end. Um, reach out to us. Ask us about the specifics. We're here. We live and breathe this. We're happy to be able to provide case consultations, um, to be able to discuss, you know, specific instances that you have and help find ways to assist, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, for you all, it's connecting both with NICMEC, but also we have a NICMEC Connect platform too as well that offers more robust training. It's kind of an on your own and on your own pace about all the different nuances of both child sexual exploitation as well as missing cases too as well. Um, and to be frank, all of you in your own ways are advocates, advocates for children to the best of your ability. So it's the idea of looking for what are the best practices that exist in these fields. we developed together with survivors, a lot of different um, publications and documentations and how can victim advocates, how can mental health providers, how can law enforcement better interact with those of the population and these crime types to be able to improve our overall response 
um, to handling child sexual exploitation to those who have experienced it. So I say that I know a little bit fast because I wanted to make sure that again, we're leaving time for any of your questions, um, but I would love at this moment in time just to point out this is an email address that you are welcome to give out to any member of the public. This get help at nickmic.org. Um, this goes to a wide variety of our teams at the National Center, and it's the quickest and the fastest way of being able to um, to provide to help NICMIC people to provide services perhaps to someone in need, um, rather than having all these different team based email or approaches. Um, if anyone needs to make a report of child sexual exploitation, you're welcome to do so at the cyber tip line. Um, and uh, if you want to be able to navigate our website, it's uh, missingkids.org, where you'll be able to see um, a wide variety of every, everything that you'll have charge. Um, my contact information will be shared. So if there's a specific question you have or specific resource you'd like connected with, please feel free to I'm happy to connect you um, to any of the resources that we do. So at this I uh, this back to Dara for any kind of closing pieces um, or any kind of questions that she may have too as well. Great. Uh, so there was one question around if this presentation will be available. Yes, we will share the slides and the recordings. Um, this is a quick announcement. We are hosting our National Summit on Youth Homelessness in March in Washington, D.C. for those who can come in person, but it will also be available virtually registration opens on October 1st. So uh, look out for early um, early bird registration rates. The only question I um, I received, and then these are our uh, personal email addresses for anyone who wants to reach out to us directly. If you do have questions, put them in chat. Someone did ask if we saw the Netflix special, The Most Hated Man on the Internet. I did not. I don't know if you did, Lauren. Um, I am not 100% familiar with that. When I was looking at one recently that was A&E that had a, a very similar name, which was about, I'm not sure if this is the exact one, um, Katie, which was about the Buster Hernandez case, um, which was a um, an individual who had exploited more than, I think, 300 different victims. Um, but I could be getting that confused. Netflix versus the a and &E, or maybe it was streaming on both, but this is certainly an issue type that has been coming up qu quite frequently. Uh, there's a couple different, um, there's actually a documentary uh, called Sextortion, the Hidden Pandemic that's going to be hitting, um, I think it's going to be hitting a streaming platform um, October 4th. So you're going to be seeing a lot more of this kind of stuff pop up. So you at least will all have kind of a, an, an extra insight into some of these um, issues and trends as you're able to kind of scope out and vet some of those um those documentaries or those stories. Well, it looks like oh, okay. the most dated man on the internet was about Hunter Moore who created a revenge porn website. Oh, I, I will definitely be looking into that now, right? Because that is uh, unfortunately um, too often where we see so many of the uh, these youth and young adult um, images and kind of ending up, so. I see I that there's a question too about languages. What languages does NICMIC support? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have um, every shift, we always have individuals um, who are fluent in Spanish. We're actually working to convert our cyber tip line reporting form into a variety of different languages as well. But all of them, um, everyone who calls into our call center also has access to the language lines. So we'll be able to connect to, I believe it's over 140 different languages. Um, through um, through that process, typically it's just done you know through an interpreter, um, but we have that donated free of charge to our organization, so we'll be able to intake any type of cases, tips, calls um, that we receive. Yeah, yeah, I see a comment that was on there. Oh, sorry, Darla. I see the comment. Oh, a lot of people think trafficking is the movie Taken, and I couldn't agree with you more. I think so often we, the best of efforts to bring attention or to highlight certain problems are done in a place that ends up creating a little bit of a tokenization, right? Like a, a one type of approach to this represents all case types. Um, and what we're seeing happen and kind of come through um, is that we're seeing, you know, trafficking of children that's starting off through online enticement. 
we're seeing, you know, these relationships building in an online capacity first, and we're seeing them on regular social media platforms that all children kind of have. So again, I think it's kind of trying to demystify too as well, just the how and the why and the what um, of the courses of these pieces and understanding that there is an intentionality and a grooming and a timing of some of these reputation, uh, these relationships that are established um, that then lead to more manipulation. And what's happened traditionally in the real world is everything moves online. Everything has that kind of capacity. So thanks for bringing that up, Katie. And the name of the documentary um, that is gonna be coming out is called Sextortion, The Hidden Pandemic. Um, we've just been seeing a couple of different screenings kind of popping up on the issue in the, um, in the general space. So I have a closing question, you know, for, for those who are interacting with young people, whether it's schools or they're a community-based service provider, what would you want them to know or to do in order to prevent or increase kind of identification and then response of this type of online um, exploitation. Yeah, I think this is probably true about how we approach a lot of things with youth, right, is really having that open mind to be able to meet children where they are, you know, a, a little bit of trying to understand what brings children to seeking out relationships. Um, and a lot of that is affirmation, you know, love, affection, attention, you know, those common kind of core drivers um, that we all have and helping to children to recognize what those signs are. You know, we at the National Center are trying to say, if there's online enticement happening, we wanna show it. We wanna put out what those chats look like, what those approaches look like. Um, and making sure, unfortunately, some of that time is too, is trying to be able to build children up so they understand their self-worth, so they're not seeking um, that in other opportunities, which, let's be real, can be very difficult, especially when we work with vulnerable populations. Um, so helping them to understand, too, that it's not their fault if they find themselves in a circumstance um, where they are vulnerable and we're taken advantage of, that there's always hope and there's always a way out. I think too often there becomes this shame, this guilt, um, and then they don't disclose, they won't come forward, they won't seek assistance. Um, and I think sometimes it's making sure people understand there are entire organizations, many like those that you work for, like ours as well, who are established here to be able to help children because these issues are so complex, even adults need assistance navigating their way through to them. So it doesn't make them, you know, it doesn't make them a bad kid. Sometimes we have to tell parents that too. Parents who call it doesn't make you a bad parent because you were, uh, your child um, experienced this, doesn't make a child a bad child. Th this is happening more prolifically. And I think we have to better understand the framework and the response of why these children are, um, why these children are going online and be able to meet them a bit where, more where they are and then tailor our approaches to that a bit better. So maybe a little bit less specific, but it's communication, 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 always, always and all the time. Hard, the hardest and the easiest, right? Great. Thank you so much, Lauren. I, thank you so much for joining us today, sharing your expertise. We really value our partnership with Nick Mick. Thank you all who joined us. If you have any questions that come up or need any technical assistance, like Lauren said, all of their resources and services are free. So please take advantage. I hope everybody has a great rest of their day. Thank you all so much. Thanks all. Thanks. Bye, everyone.